So in the build-up to Biofabrication 2021, held online on September 27 to 29, we're chatting with Professor Michael Galinsky from Dresden University of Technology, uh, who will be one of the plenary speakers at the conference. Uh, thanks so much for joining me, Michael. You're welcome. We're getting used to this online uh, format as the, the conference will be held. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's going to be a pleasure to have you uh, join us and uh, I'd like to start uh, with I guess a little bit of your background um, and your work and how it incorporates biomaterials and biofabrication. So my lab was uh, initially focused on materials development, biomaterials development and um, development of scaffolds for tissue engineering applications for several uh, types of tissue and uh, we became especially interested in um, designing unisotropic tish, tissue scaffolds, as of course most of the tissues or maybe all of our tissues in the body have a highly unisotropic structure and, and architecture. And uh, then of course we uh, discovered more or less, so 10, 15 years back that 3D printing at that time, not yet bioprinting, bio publication, but, but just additive manufacturing uh, is offering a really nice opportunity for very con con, um, um, controlled fabrication of uh, scaffolds, also of course for the combination of different types of materials, which is uh, definitely not so easy with conventional scaffold um, fabrication methods. Um, yeah, and therefore we stepped in into additive manufacturing, mostly using um, extrusion-based methods. Um, and then it was a, a small step to include one cells, um, which of course offers the very nice opportunity to create an, an cell loaded living construct in one process step compared to the conventional two step, uh, first making the scaffold and then seeding that with cells. Yeah, so uh, biofabrication and you know material science, it's a very broad area, obviously. Uh, what would be the most exciting uh, part of it for you? That's uh, difficult to say, as there are so many really, uh, <laughs> uh, hot, hot developments in the in the last couple of, of years. So in, in my lab, maybe um, two topics I could mention here on the one hand side, that is um, bioprinting of non mammalian cells. So up to now, uh, really, the, the big majority um, of the community is focused on printing of either human cells or animal derived cells for medical applications. And uh, already quite a couple of years back, we started first just for fun to include um, completely other cell types into the bioprinting processes. So we have been the first worldwide um, successfully printing um, green microalgae. Wow. Which also uh, were, were then kept photosynthetically active. After the printing process, um, again, we have been the first worldwide printing, bioprinting successfully plant derived cells. And um, yeah, then we started to work for, further on that. We also started to bioprint uh, co culture systems consisting of green algae and human cells, aiming in creating uh, constructs which are independent from external oxygen supply, as the photosynthetically active green algae can produce the oxygen necessary and consumed then by the human cells. Um, not so easy, quite tricky, as of course, these <laughs> different cell types need uh, very different types of, for example, cell culture media, light is an issue, the algae need, the human cells in most cases don't like, and so on. But we are on a good way to solve uh, these issues. And uh, yeah, that's really fun. And another maybe even more, um, um yeah special topic is bioprinting in space so bioprinting bio biofabrication for applications in space flight we were um quite happy to get funding on that topic from the european space agency for around two years um 2018 and 19 which was the first contact for me with the topic <laughs> space flight um, and yeah, but that topic is really developing very fast in the moment. Um, probably all the big international space agencies got 
interested in uh, bioprinting. There is already in the American uh, National Lab on the ISS, on the International Space Station, there is already a bioprinter installed there by a private company. The Russian um, space agency has um, sent to the ISS a machine for bioassembly, so definitely not bioprinting, but bioassembly. Um, our well-known society member, Vladimir Mironov, is um, uh, heavily in, in, in involved in that project. And now also the European Space Agency is definitely planning to send a combined extrusion and um, inkjet-based bioprinter to space. And yeah, so we have started to in, um, investigate in Dresden um, the technical requirements, the issues related to extrusion printing under microgravity con conditions, and of course, mainly for what bioprinting really could be used in space. And that's a, yeah, that's a really fascinating topic. I definitely also will include some uh, parts in, in, the, in the lecture. Yeah, fascinating. And I guess you've, you've sort of mentioned it there. And as I mentioned, you're going to be one of the plenary speakers for the conference. Um, I'm wondering what the uh, gist of the latest news you'll be sharing with us at Biofab 2021 will be. What I definitely will include um, is a part of our work on combinations combination of different types of materials, especially so different materials like soft cell laden bio inks and calcium phosphate bone cements, which set after the extrusion printing process to really stiff and solid um, calcium phosphate um, frameworks. Combination of different technologies. So we are heavily working in the moment on combinations of um, extrusion printing, bioprinting and melt electro writing, which also leads to um, constructs with fascinating novel opportunities. We are just stepping into um, combinations of extrusion and uh, inkjet printing and bioprinting, which is also an, an uh, opportunity for really novel type of, of tissue models. Um, and last but not least, also a combination of different cell types. I already mentioned that co-cultures um, consisting of uh, photosynthetically active green algae and human cells. But um, there are many other um, combinations now in the family of the human cells um, to yeah, have more uh, or to, to realize constructs which come closer to the biological tissues by combining different cell types in a highly organized, predefined manner. So this at least will maybe a bit of, of the, the red line I want to follow in my in my lecture. <laughs> so just to finish up, I'm wondering where you might think the field will be in say uh, five years time. That's a hard question as all <laughs> questions related with the future developments. Um, so I think we all can see that the field is tremendously growing more or less any lab working in the field of, of uh, biomaterials and, and regenerative medicine um, has now a 3D printer or even a 3D bioprinter in the lab and is starting to do at least a, a, a bit of work. And therefore, the number of studies are really um, exploding. Not everything which is publish, published really brings the field forward. That's, of course, also logical. Uh, nevertheless, we have a, a huge databases now. We have a we have a huge um, variety of materials suitable for both um, material printing and, of course, also bioprinting. We have um, a, a huge selection of, of hardware, of uh, printers, which allow also the combination of different printing methods, as I have mentioned before, which, which really opens up um, possibilities for novel types of constructs. And therefore, um, I have at least the hope that we are uh, moving now forward uh, in, in two main di directions. One is to be able to really provide more functional tissue models so that we are not just proud that the cells are still living two weeks after printing, <laughs> but that the cells really are or at least become over time functional, mm -hmm. um, which of course is, is the cruel uh, question for tissue models like liver, uh, kidney, whatever, they, they need to, to become functional. And the second point is that 
Um, I am quite sure that we will be able to to become um, or to yeah, to to realize more and more bioprinted bio fabricated constructs of clinically relevant mm -hmm. dimensions. So we can read about printing a human heart, printing a human kidney, and then if you look in the in the, um, the paper, it's the size of a mouse organ. <laughs> uh, and so one of the really fundamental limitations is. Um, making the things bigger, but still, of course, viable. And then we are running into problems with, of course, oxygen, so supply vascularization, all that issue is definitely not solved yet. Um, yeah, but I think in these two um, topics, we will for sure see significant progress in the next five years. Whereas I'm a bit skeptical concerning clinical trans translation, mm -hmm. um, for a number of tissues, uh, the technology is ready for my um feeling like skin for example on the other hand we have these extremely strict regulatory problems and just now a couple of days back european union has started uh, or a new type of regulation came into force here and so bringing these cell containing constructs really to the patient that gets more and more difficult and so uh, yeah probably this still will be delayed even from the scientific point of view, a number of applications, for my feeling, are already ready for clinical tra translation. So hopefully, also here we will see a bit more in the next uh, five years. Yeah, well, it's yeah, certainly an exciting time uh, for the field of biofabrication, and um, you know, your talk is no doubt going to be just as exciting. So. I'm looking forward to it and I'm sure everyone that's um, registered and that will register uh, will look forward to it as well. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to catch up and build a bit of excitement for um, the conference. You're welcome. And also looking uh, forward very much to this, to this conference. And of course, I'm very honored to be one of the, of the plenary speakers there.